Hi everyone, it's Maureen. I wanted to take some time to kind of show you um, one of my vintage sewing machines and I also wanted to show you the one that I was able to recently get working again to a certain extent but still am working on. Um, this one happens to be a 1928 or actually excuse me a 1923 Singer Model 66. Let's see if I can kind of let you see it better from the front here. There we go. And this particular machine sort of has, it's known as a red eye because of the various different motifs in the front that sort of are red and ocular shaped and on various different parts of the machine. This machine I purchased separate of the treadle table that I happen to have here. And this sort of resides in my basement. You may possibly hear the heater come on later. It's a little bit of a noisy place to sew, especially if the washing machine is going. But uh, I wanted to kind of show you the progress I was able to make. Since this machine is not electrified, and when I got it, it was not electrified, I've had to come up with a lighting system here. So I, I have a overhead lamp like you would buy for an apartment and I have one of the sort of a reading lamp where one of the lamps is adjustable. So what I've been doing and what I have figured out is some tension issues specifically with this machine. It seems to enjoy a heavier cotton thread and the way that I've tensioned this, this is wool fabric that I happen to have extras of. And it took about a few hours and about three spools of polyester thread to say, wait a minute, there's something this machine doesn't, seems to shred it. And I went through all the tension settings with the tensioner here on the, the front of the machine. And it was just trying to figure out what this machine liked as far as actual thread and the tension and things of this nature because what kept happening is that there was nesting on the back side. I would sew a line, it would look great on top, but when I would flip it over, it would all be messy. So what I've learned, and you may not be able to see this portion because it's sort of down lower, but we have the, the treadle. There is basically a, this leather portion right here on the end and this basically is used like a drive belt so to speak and basically takes the motion that you're able to make with the treadle down below and allows this to spin and we're going clockwise like we're going towards us so you're going counterclockwise if you were viewing this from this end but um this machine I have named Margaret. It takes a little bit of practice to get back into it again. But once you get started, it's not so bad. And pull it back up to its fullest height. And then you can lift up your presser foot even though I had actually gone backwards, which you're not supposed to do, I still created this straight line of stitching. Let's see if I can put through. Let me find a pair of scissors here to make this a little easier to show you. It doesn't look like I have my scissors nearby, so bear with me. handy dandy key out here so the table itself whoop, there we are <laughs> the table itself has a locking system that just uses a slot so I have a whole bunch of just turn you right here maybe this will be a lot easier has this tray right here which I have a whole bunch of very similar cotton threads to it 
And then the side tables, or side drawers, basically pull out. Let's see, those are extra feet. Those are those. I'm going to have to move you for a moment. Hello? <laughs> scissors. Here we go. Hopefully these are sharp, sharp. Oh, they're sharp enough to cut. Okay, so we have scissors. And actually, that was one thing. When I dug through the table, there was supplies already in it, which was amazing. So I have extra supplies. They need to be cleaned up. Um, WD-40 is your friend for surface rust on these machines. Uh, you can soak parts. It's not going to bring back the shiny finish, though, to the parts that that you kind of see it'll at least get rid of the surface ru rust and prevent it from from continuing to rust but this line of stitching right here is the back side that i just created right there in between my two thumbs and even with accidentally going backwards which you're not supposed to do um, it still maintained doing the proper stitches. It didn't tangle and, and nest. And it's the same on the front as it is on the back. Um, it was quite a relief to at least find the kind of thread that this machine was looking for. And what I recommend, if you do decide to buy one of these machines, uh, it's going to be difficult to determine whether or not the machine actually works by just looking at images and pictures and things of this nature. You may, as a purchaser, you may end up having to actually do a little bit of work and research on your own to determine, can I use this machine? Is it something that actually will make it so? <laughs> and such. What I did is they make reprints of the model, different model machines. And I bought a couple different ones. Um, I have a Singer Sewing Machines classes 66 and 60K. 66 would be mine. Or in this case, Meshing class 66, which kind of looks closer to what we're looking at here. Um, and this gives you a listing of all of the parts. So if you were missing a part, so to speak, it gives you the model number of everything. Like for example, the machine I have over on the other side has one of these bobbin winders, but it is missing the screw right in front of the wheel that actually holds this on and in position. And it moves up and down when you have a bobbin and appropriately put it in, in its correct location. And um, this might be helpful that if I needed to order a part, so to speak, or I'd at least have the part number that I could go in and see if maybe I could find it on eBay. Because this is the thing. These old machines, getting the parts is going to be difficult, especially if it's a bigger part, like say like a brand new tensioner. Singer's not making these parts anymore. You almost have to get them from a donor machine and pray to God that it actually isn't, isn't broken, so to speak. Or there are people online, various different sellers, that will sell parts of old machines to people that may, like myself, who are trying to keep an old machine running. But eventually, you know, will, will we run out of parts for these old machines? It's a great possibility, but if you keep them in, in good shape, they've lasted many lifetimes so far. I mean, this one comes from 1923, or was manufactured in 1923. And the other machine on the other side, which I will show you in a minute, is from 1919, and they pretty much work, so I'm just thrilled to pieces that it actually sews. I was really afraid that I had bought sort of a, a pretty machine that was going to end up just being some sort of 
decorator piece and some of these are where you're seeing it sit in somebody's hallway as a knickknack rack or a decorative plant stand and there's a machine there but it just it sits there it doesn't actually do anything okay yet again a nice clean row of stitching and the back side is just as beautiful i am so excited uh, it was a, a real eureka moment when i was actually able to get her going because i was really afraid that i had bought a machine that ended up being more decorator than anything so because she likes a thicker cotton thread and I have her tension basically for wool because I will be making some wool dresses here pretty soon um, I'm going to kind of try to keep her settings for wool at this point in time which I'm, I have several dresses that I'm gonna make so trust me it's gonna come in very very handy and some some of these white pieces you yeah there you go some of the white pieces you're seeing that's the polyester thread that the machine just wanted to shred or didn't want to even acknowledge so to speak so i kind of went a little crazy i bought some thread now what this is is this is guterman's quilting cotton threads and this is not all the colors that they offer this is a large variety of it but I wanted to have several different colors. I have a blue dress or a blue wool and a like a purplish one and then a red one. So this is more colors than I need for that, so to speak. But I wanted to have a range of colors that if I wanted to just do wool on this machine, which is my plan, that I have some colors to work with. And I have also these it's called Americana quilting thread and it does have an outer coating with it so I will have to probably get the machine cleaned a little bit more regularly because that coating is sort of like wax it, it would come off it could possibly gum up the machine so it is something that I am taking into consideration I do have a Singer sewing machine dealer and uh, someone who is used to these old machines and knows how they work and function and has over 40 years experience working with them. So the beautiful thing about this is I know I have an expert with these that I can have any issues fixed, so to speak. The table is a little disappointing as my, my father was a, a woodworker, so to speak. So for me, when I see all this laminated wood, I'm, I'm always just a slight bit disappointed because it would have been, yes, more expensive making it out of a hardwood. But you wouldn't have spots missing or this coming up or needing to be reclamped and re-glued, however, later. The machines are definitely made to last, but I, I always wondered about some of the construction on these tables, other than the chassis down here. Let me see. I'm going to just... Yes, you're coming down. All right. Other than the chassis down below here, which I'm going to lower you down, so just hold on with me here. This is going to get kind of interesting pretty quickly. You're going to deal with a little bit of shaky cam here until I get all the legs in. Oh, there we go. All right. So here's the chassis underneath. I don't know if you can see it so much from the side. Kind of difficult. Tripods are a great thing, but sometimes it gets a little extra challenging. probably can see a good amount. There we go. Basket out of the way. All right, so I'm going 
going to go ahead now yes I'm wearing sneakers it is with this whole situation I found yes it is much easier to do, do this in your stocking feet or in socks because you can feel the grate a bit better so to speak so I am going to keep up, kick off my shoes here real quick because you can feel with the bottoms of your feet the pressure that you're creating. So up top here, I'm doing just what you saw me do before. I'm putting the presser foot down. I am pulling the wheel towards me. And directing the stitching where it needs to go. And now that I'm stopping, Press your foot up, pull the material out, and stitch or uh, snip the threads. Yet again, another wonderful line of stitching, top and bottom. So it takes a little bit of practice, I would say, with these machines getting a rhythm in this case because just trying to get this started and the the leather band that's right right here there's a little break a little knob right there but if you let's say hit that knob a little too hard the band can jump out from the pulley system and make that a little bit more difficult with trying to get the leather band back into the, the system. Um, I was pretty fortunate that this chassis on the bottom is solid. There's a little bit of surface rust, but it's extremely minor. Uh, it looks like it was stored in as dry of, of a place as possible. The lamination on the top always comes loose. It's uh, sort of the sad part that suffers, so to speak. But I have to say the the drawer sides, they're solid. There's no uh, wood coming loose on them, so to speak. So pretty, pretty fortunate with this purchase altogether. I know I had um, kind of showed in general how it worked, so to speak, but I didn't have it stitching the last time that I videoed or sent, made a video for YouTube, so I'm so thrilled that she works. Because uh, if you were hoping that the machine worked and then you purchase everything, you know, the treadle table and such, and then end up with a decorator piece, well, that certainly makes things a lot more complicated in the end. Bear with me while I make you taller. Okay. What you're seeing is a vintage sewing machine cover made from vintage fabric that is manufactured by Singer. And when I saw it, I already had my first machine. And I said to myself, my goodness, I need to make some sewing machine covers out of this because, yes, well, I have two and I had enough material that I made two. I didn't realize that I was going to have two machines, but I figured one would be a spare dust cover. But here is the second. Now, she's not as pretty and clean and rust free as her sister but this is a 1919 singer sewing machine model 66 red eye as well so same motifs but as you can see some of the some of that is missing down here and there's a layer of yellow underneath where all the gold leaf would have been so at this point this machine has really been through the ringer so to speak we still have paint thank goodness 
Um, normally there is a uh, bobbin winder here and that's not here right now because I don't have the right screw to fit the hole. I will find one. But I put a hand crank. Let me put you back up. There we go. This is a reproduction hand crank. For some reason, the 1919 Singer Model 66, this was the one that originally came in the treadle table that's just next to us, over to my left. And I bought the hand crank originally for my 1923 because I figured, well, I'm, I have my mother's table. This is my mother's sewing table. And I thought to myself, well, I'll just do a hand, hand crank there. So it, it means you're gonna be directing the fabric with one hand and cranking with the other. And when I got this machine, I wasn't even able to do this as far as creating any real movement. It was really, really stiff. What ended up happening, and what I'm going to be doing with this machine, is a lot of WD-40. On the metal parts only, though. Uh, there is a lot of surface rust. There's minor pitting, very, very minor pitting on the wheel itself. I just want to get rid of the rust, and even if it's a matte finish, that's perfectly fine. But my goal with this machine, and I have to put a needle in her, now, you can use Singer needles. Schmetz does make replacement needles as, as well. And I use them for my modern machines mainly, but they do work on the Singer machine because I have a Schmetz needle even in my other Singer over yonder. So, what I'm doing is there is a little turn over here. I'm gonna put this at its highest level. And it basically clamps, so there is a flat part to the needle. That flat part goes against the rod coming down, and then you tighten the little little screw, that's sort of like a thumb screw almost, and then that secures the needle in place. Now I will have to get a bobbin for the bottom here and the bobbin case is a little rusty on this one so I am a bit concerned with that but what I will do is get in with WD-40 and scrub the ever living crap out of the inside here and then re-oil it um, to try to get rid of the, the rust as much as possible. Um, but I did, when I first pulled this out because I had it set aside when I first received the table. And I pulled this aside thinking it might be a don possible donor machine for my 1923 if needed. Because it was frozen, it really was not moving. And the presser foot, I couldn't do this. I couldn't move the presser foot up and down. And the presser foot handle is even a little bit rusted, so I'll have to scrub that up too. But what my initial goal with all of this is, is going to be is to just get rid of the rust, keep her as clean as possible, and then when I do tension her, because I think her tension mechanism actually over here is cleaner of all things than my 1923 over on the other side, um, I want to tension her for linen so I could do shirts, chemises, and all of my under items on her. Um, since her decals are a little bit more worn, it isn't going to bother me to kind of push things through with her so much as compared to other, to my other machine, so to speak. So I have to see what she's going to do, but that was some of the reason also that I bought the lighter colors of the cotton thread on my thread display I just showed you, because I figure, well, if I want to do linens, if I want to do chemises and shirts for the Tudor time frame, I'm going to need um, something in the, in the light ranges. So that's why I also sort of got browns 
browns, tans, and whites, off whites. So this is my 1919 Singer sewing machine. Her name is Gertrude. The other machine's name is Margaret. Um, so we do have some nicknames. So we can call her Gertie, and then we can call um, Margaret Maggie when, when they're being good girls. Um, maybe their nicknames will be used. But uh, what I find really fascinating with her, so to speak, is that I think, for the sake of argument, let's thread her up and see what happens. I'm kind of curious, to be honest with you. Let's see. I have plenty of white off-white color. And I'm just going to use the same Americana that I was using before, but I will have to get... Hey, Bobbin. Let's see here. Do we have any that are blank? This one's blank. All right. Now, what I've been doing, the bobbin winder that I have on my other machine is not, not functioning the way that I would like it to be functioning, I guess you could say. So that definitely makes things a little tricky. So I've been winding bobbins by hand as much fun as that is. As you can imagine, that is just thrilling and wondrous and yeah, woo. So off camera, that's exactly what I'm doing. I am winding a bobbin by hand and you can, you can do this. I could even, there are little bobbin winders that you can purchase that are separate of any sewing machine, but they allow you to wind all sorts of different kinds of bobbins. But in reality, I'm just gonna fill this up with the white, well, this is an off-white color of the white cotton quilting thread, same Americana that I was using before. And the little red pads that you're seeing, this is just red wool that I happen to actually have around. And I cut those to place because I've noticed that the original machines had these little pads to protect the paint. Because there actually is a decal. There's a de decal right here. And this would get all scraped up if you didn't have something uh, protecting the spool of thread from... The machine itself. Now this thread I would say definitely is you know of a thicker variety and when I make my outfits for me to wear nothing for arts and sciences related things in the SCA I do those by hand and I do a lot of finishing by hand of my uh, outfits, so to speak. But what I love about a machine, and I, I love these old machines because they are a work of art as well as a utilitarian piece of machinery that somebody would have been using to create their own clothing. And clothing being a commodity and much more expensive and fabric still is expensive today, um, but it's maybe a little easier to manufacture or to, to a certain extent. But if you try to make an outfit, so to speak, unless you're making it out of like quilting cotton or something very uh, inexpensive to get a hold of, making your own clothes is still something that actually would take up a, a bit of money in, in budget, but granted you have the benefit then. Once you've made your clothing item, it's yours. You designed it, you made it, or you're using a pattern, but it's gonna be one of a kind because you made it, you uh, picked the fabric. So unless somebody else maybe had picked that exact same fabric, so to speak, for the most part, it's gonna be a what I like to call a one-off, A unique particular piece of clothing. 
so with like my historical outfits based on Tudor patterns and clothing like this, what I'm kind of also hoping to do is that since I have the wool setting on the other machine and I have my linen, linen setting on here, I can do I can do my linings on this machine, assemble them together, and then um, attach them to the main wool and then it, it could be stitched down on the other machine which has a thicker tension setting at this point. I mean it could be stitched down but typically by the time I have all the inside pieces that's actually what it is. All my hidden seams I machine them because even though my hand seams are strong as I get older my hands get tired quicker. I'm not necessarily old, so to speak. I'm not, I haven't even reached the age of 40 yet. But we do live in a modern age. So I'm going to use a little bit of convenience on the everyday garb that I'm wearing in the SCA. Because it's not going into an arts and sciences competition. It's for me to wear. So having that machined is not a big deal. I can hand stitch all of the other things that I think will be seen, so to speak, just to have that nice, nice look. And my hand sewing has improved over time. My stitches were not very even to start with, but everybody has to start somewhere. So let's keep that in mind. I'm trying to wind on a good amount of thread onto the bobbin here just for the sake that, well, if you're going to do it, don't put just a tiny little bit on, put a good amount on. Very, I live in the, the northeastern United States, and having these in my basement would have me concerned if I lived in, in, in any other house. But I feel very fortunate that the house that I live in actually doesn't have any access to the basement from the outside. So it actually keeps the basement dry and relatively moisture free. I mean, I probably could run a dehumidifier down here, but to be honest with you, it's not, it's not bad at all. Um, I keep some of my actual modern wardrobe down here too, and everything sort of is, is in totes. I know that's not the most ideal uh, clothing storage method, but it's what I have, and at least the basement itself is, is dry. And I don't live in a regularly wet um, environment, so to speak. There, there are creeks nearby, so to speak, but it's one of those situations that um, I'm not really in a floodplain. The house is sort of on a little bit of a hill, thank goodness, so that really pre prevents what you would call, you know, your typical flooding situation. also get to see a threading of the machine. So what I'm going to do first is I have my bobbin. It's about three quarters full of thread. I put it in the bobbin holder here and then there is a little slit over on the other, this be on the far left hand side, there's a little slit that you put the thread into. And there's this little knob right here a little knob right in the very front that allows you to pop up your bobbin a little bit and take it back out. So I just did that so I could have less of a tail on, on my bobbin thread. So I'm going to close that up. So there's a pin here already. And 
And so I go basically to this little knob first, down and around the tensioner. There is a little hole right here that you can put the thread through. And then I put it through the top portion of, of that. There's a little, oop, oh, guess I'm gonna have to slide it through because it doesn't seem to wanna just pop in. There's a little thread loop on the very front of the machine here. So I just pop that in. I'm gonna go get my pair of scissors to make that nice and clean. Now the beautiful thing about this is there's nothing down here on the floor I have to do. I'm, it's all by hand crank in this case. So what this does is the needle eye is on the side. It, it's not from front to back, it's side to side. So you're going, you're threading it left to right got that through and then I put the needle down through and up and that pulls the bobbin thread through now I have the tiniest little tail on this so I'm gonna pull if possible Do this again. I'm going to open up the case there. There we go. That does seem to slide at least a little bit. So I pull a generous amount through and then I just snip it off so I don't have a whole lot of excess floating around. It does seem to be catching down underneath a little bit because of it being rusty. So that is something that I will have to address. And I'm going to go locate a quick piece of fabric that's not the wool, something a little thinner. So I located a medium weight piece of linen. I have several more pieces here. I'm just gonna grab a couple. I don't need very big pieces for this kind of situation. So I'm gonna fold some of these up and put them back. I will just keep these two. Yeah. What I want to do is something like this would be chemise weight fabric. I want to see what the machine does to start with. So I'm going to keep the other pieces nearby. Put these up against that. Alright, grab a 
my scissors. We're going to see how this sews. Now, this won't surprise me if it ends up nesting, but I'll be able to show you what that looks like. So I'm going to put two, two pieces together. And we're just going to go lengthwise here. So we put our presser foot down. Typically, I like, there we go, put that underneath the foot. Sometimes it doesn't like to. This is one of those wider open feet for the machine. There we go. All right. And I'm just going to do a straight line down. I'm going to actually move you to the other side. So hold on a moment here because you'll be able to see it better and we'll be seeing less of me this way. There. <laughs> All right. So basically what we're doing is we're just going to see what we're doing with this. we probably broke our thread. Yeah, starting to bind down there for sure. Okay, there we go. So, what it wanted to do was bind below underneath the machine a little bit. So, we kind of broke off a, a piece. So, we'll try it again. There is some rust I'm seeing, so this definitely tells me there's something going on that I'll have to address. Yeah. If you hear that noise, what it's doing is the bobbin thread underneath is getting caught and snagging. And so it's also making it hard to turn the machine to. Oh, there we go. definitely have to address the rust because it's dirty um, but this is a great test because to be honest other than dealing with a little bit of nesting on the bottom and the tension is a bit too tight um, I think it's a little too tight on the top but here's a little bit of nesting that, that we had but to be honest with you that means that she sews though. So we have another second functional machine, which is fantastic. That's exactly what you want. Um, but what that tells me though, is I don't really wanna go any further right now until I address the rust down here, because A, it's staining our fabric. We can't have that, especially if I'm gonna do linens on this machine. So I'm going to have to clean her up really well. And B, I'll leave the tension as it is. I'm not going to touch it. And then once I get everything cleaned up, especially the rust making that snagging noise underneath, that tells me that I'm going to um, get that all cleaned up first. And then from there, try this again and see what happens as far as getting the tension taken care of once the rust down here is done. Um, I do have a little bit of surface rust here on the presser foot and um, there's another panel behind here that has a little bit and that can be uh, gently worked with but I wanted to thank everyone for coming in this far uh, to this video and kind of seeing how the machines work um, don't be afraid to take an adventure because I'll say this this has been very much an adventure learning to use these machines and then being able to have one machine at a thicker tension for the wool, have one of these at a thinner tension eventually for the linen, and I won't have to mess with it too much because those are gonna be my main two fibers that I'm working with most of the time. Then I'll be able to just go from there. 
and uh, watch a later video because Gertrude here will get not necessarily a makeover but get all cleaned up get rid of all of the the rust as much as possible and I'll be able to show you how she's working once all of the tension issues and the rust is taken care of if you enjoy this kind of content please consider liking this video and possibly subscribing I try to upload every other Friday and we have adventures so Stay tuned. Bye.